Today is Father's Day. We give you the, the glory for our lives. We give you the credit for every good thing in our lives, Father. Lord Jesus, we confess that you are our daily bread. And Father, just thank you for allowing us to be here today and to hear your holy word, to have it engrafted into our hearts by faith, that we will be better fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, and above all, Lord God, that we will be better servants to you. We ask this, Father, we receive this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you know, we're doing a study of the Gospel of Mark, which we might as well say really is a study of the Gospel of Peter, since Peter is telling Mark what to write. It's really Mark's reflections on Peter's life. But in our study last week, we saw how this very first group of disciples had to implement the Gospel that Jesus was teaching the gospel that the kingdom of God was here and that it caused many to come to repentance. That is an important word and we want to remind ourselves of it every week because we think of repentance all, only as the fact of, of uh, repenting for sin. That isn't what Jesus is speaking about. He's saying kingdom of God is hand. We need to accept that. We need to repent, which is in other words to change your thinking whether it's sin or anything, repent means to change your thinking about things. So the disciples are being uh, required to change their thinking about their thinking about a lot of things. Simon, Andrew, James, and John knew Jesus was doing remarkable things that brought credence to his gospel. But it was the way he was doing things that constantly brought them to repentance. Repenting about the kingdom. Uh, Jesus... Uh, Jesus preached required radical change, radical thinking. We saw that last week when we saw him touch a leper. And, uh, you know, that, that was the one thing you just absolutely did not do. It was against the law to do. And that Jesus, after he touched that leper and healed him, should have himself gone and shown himself to the priest. But he did not do that. He didn't need to do that. And it was a, a lot of things that his disciples, these early disciples are seeing, but they don't really understand. But it, because it does take a radical change, it's a radical thinking. You know, there's Christians today that really don't understand the kingdom of God and need radical thinking about it. Jesus was causing them to rethink almost 1,500 years of religion. Their religion was come to life, and they're going to be brought to repentance very soon once again. A word that we want to consider this morning to keep in your thinking is a simple word, they. Well, you know what they say. You hear that all the time. Well, you know what people say. You know what they say. And everybody wants to know who's they. So we're going to find out today who they is. And we'll find out, hopefully, it's us. But Jesus and his fishermen disciples, who are being moved from fishermen to apostles little by little, have been traveling all around northern Galilee, going to the different cities, going to the different synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, casting out demons, preaching with authority, healing the sick. But now it's time to return to home base. For our story today, it's time that they come home to Capernaum. Some translations, I believe it's Luke, will even say that the house where, where this story happens was actually Jesus' own home, that he bought it. Could well be. Could be this is still Simon Peter's home. Uh, we don't know. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't affect the story. What happens, happens. And for those of you who may say, well, wait a minute, I, I couldn't realize that Jesus could afford a home, then you need to go back to our Christmas teachings about the Magi and the gifts that they brought and really how big it was and so on, because we explained a lot of that where Jesus came up with the funds for being able to do the ministry that he's doing. He very well could have bought a house in Capernaum. But either way, it doesn't affect the story, but it begins here. Again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house, again, whichever house. Immediately, many gathered together, so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. I would love... To have, had, to have heard Jesus preach the word. I mean, you think about it. The word is preaching the word. That wasn't lost on the Apostle John. He said this 
In the beginning was the Word, describing Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That was true light which gives light to every man who comes into the world. And the, world, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus said this about Himself. He said, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. I mean, you really think about it. Here's Jesus preaching the Word. He's going all over Galilee preaching the Word. But He is the Word. And I wonder how He handled that. I did this, I did that. I remember when I made the moon, the stars, the this, the that. The, the, you know, it would have been remarkable and I certainly would have enjoyed listening to Him preach Himself about the Kingdom. Uh, and that's exactly what He was doing in this house in Capernaum. The house where... Uh, the house that was flooded with people, from the, the, the house itself was flooded with people, the yard was flooded with people, the streets flooded with people, and you can't even get close to Jesus, and that is when they come. Let's read it. You just switch over one, Amy. There you go. Then they they. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Doesn't tell us who they are. We're not told who they are. Most commentaries that you'll read on this story, and you're all familiar with this story, if you came up through Sunday school or any kind of church history at all, whether they, they will open up a roof, they will let the man down, showing great faith to get him to Jesus, doing what they can to get him to Jesus. Indeed, whoever did it, they were indeed friends. And that's what most of the commentaries say. But I happen to think a little different. I happen to think that this is family that is bringing him. Uh, and if you'd ask me why, it's because of the care that this man required involved, uh, the care involved in caring for him was very personal and very intimate. I think when we look at this story, and we all love this story if you're familiar with it. But I think that we have too sanitized a version of this story. Uh, I can remember getting Sunday school material when I was a kid. And what would you would have like a cartoon, you know, that followed the story. And you would see if you, in your mind's eye you can still see it. A picture of a, almost like a beggar with, who can't use his legs. with holding up a bull, asking people to give him alms, begging for a living. But that might be very much too sanitized for what the story may have really been. And the reason I bring that up is because, you know, sometimes you hear something, you see something, and it really sticks with you. And that happened to me. There was a kind of a conference on the John Ankerberg television program. And he had brought people together that were sufferers of chronic pain. And he was having a conversation with, with people who had chronic pain Chronic meaning they had it day in, day out. There was no relief for it and they had to live with it. And one of the people that he brought onto this conversation was Johnny Erickson Tata. Most of you are very familiar with her. Uh, she is, I believe, uh, paralyzed from her feet to her neck. She's a quadriplegic. And she was really opening up in this conversation. And at that time, we were doing a lot of ministry with Bruce and Sue Harger, if you remember. And Sue was in constant pain with her back. And there was nothing when they would get a prescription of, of uh, oh, what's the heavy duty painkiller they give you? What is it? Morphine, yeah. And they would go through all the morphine that they were prescribed, and she'd still beg for more because she was in such pain. And that's the first time in my life that I was that close to somebody that had chronic pain. It, we were fortunate in our family that even though my mother and father had their issues like everybody, heart disease and cancer and so on, but they didn't know chronic pain like that. And uh, so I was very interested to hear how she as a Christian woman dealt with it. And... Like a lot of people, I think we just look at that situation and we have these paradigms in our thinking. 
and we may not really fully realize uh, how indebted to people they are for their care. And I'm setting up a stage of maybe what was really going on with this para, 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 paralytic man, because we're not told how paralyzed he is, but we certainly know he cannot walk. But he may have been very bad. And it was interesting to hear Johnny Erickson give her talk about, it came down to, as you can imagine, that it's through Jesus that she was able to get through everything. But it was very real what she was talking about. And as much as she is a very fine and devoted Christian, she's also a human being. The same fears and same concerns that we all have. And she was saying that mornings for her were the worst. She said, you don't realize as quadriplegic, however you were put into bed is how you stay in bed. And so when the next morning you wake up, you are laying in the very same position you were put in when you went to bed. And she said, when you wake up in the morning and the house is totally silent, she said, is when the panic attacks happen. She says, you panic because you know that if you don't hear the sound of another human being, you will probably die right where you're at. You cannot feed yourself. You cannot move yourself. You cannot give yourself a drink of water. You cannot help yourself pass your bodily functions. Nobody is going to wipe your behind. I don't want to make this pretty, but you have none of that. And she said as soon as she would hear a door open or a voice speak or just hear somebody in the house, it gave her great relief because she was totally dependent that somebody should come for her. And that was hard to forget thinking about that. And I, I really think so much of her because she was also telling how it never fails. She goes and speaks at a lot of different places, a lot of Christian venues and churches. And she said it never seems to fail that when she's, I guess they got a special van that they load her wheelchair in. And it'll always be, she said, that somebody will see me on the parking lot and come over. And she says, and normally it'll be some wonderful soul that always wants to say, can I pray for you? Because everybody wants to see her get out of that wheelchair and walk and Nobody more than herself, but she's been through all prayers. But there's always somebody who thinks maybe it's their prayer that will make a difference. And so this woman came up to her and said, do you mind if I pray for you? And she said, yes, but when you pray, she said, would you please pray about my stubbornness? She said, I just don't do what the Lord tells me to do sometimes as quick as I should. Would you pray for that? And this woman was just, her eyes just got real big because she, you know, that's the last thing you would expect. It was going to be get out of the wheelchair. I think she's accepted that the wheelchair is her ministry. But she has other issues in her life. And I thought that was really, that would have to have been very amazing. And I would have liked to have seen the look on that woman's face when she asked her to pray for her stubbornness. So sometimes I think we get a paradigm of looking at something. And I think we've got a wrong paradigm about this paralytic. And I want to look at this. You know, I enjoy looking at stories in the Bible with you from a little different perspective than how they're normally preached. And yet, of course, backing it up with Scripture. Think about this man that we're talking about, this paralytic. Maybe he was brought to Jesus, because there's a question here of why, you know, Jesus was there before. We know the story. Jesus kind of starts his ministry at Capernaum. Remember, he goes there, the, the fishermen are, are part of the synagogue. He goes into the synagogue, they, they invite him to do the teaching, and he teaches like one having authority, and then the demon cries out that knows Jesus, and how Jesus casts out the demon, and he's healing the sick, and how after the, the sun went down for the Sabbath, how people just flooded the house, Simon Peter's house, and uh, you know people were coming up to Jesus for all these healings and so on that were going on probably late into the night. But this man wasn't there. And you have to wonder for a moment, why wasn't he? Maybe he, had, maybe, if, maybe he was brought to Jesus by his family that had helped him for all these years, doing for him what others either could not or would not do. You know, there's some things you've got to almost keep in the family. Some things are so personal. Uh, there's things that, you know, are just personal that you have to take care of. It. Family takes care of family. And this may have been part of the reason. Some ask, again, why didn't his family bring him to Jesus on that first Sabbath? If we would understand Jewish thought, pay, pay attention to me here, this isn't going to make sense. 
If we understand Jewish thinking, particularly in that day, we would realize that this man may well have been paralyzed in his spirit as well as in his body. He may have not asked, he, he may not have asked for anyone to take him to this healing rabbi because the Jews equated sickness with sin. If you had a grievous sickness, it must be because you had a grievous sin. The rabbis had a saying, quote, There is no sick man healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven. This attitude was found in many cultures and is found in many cultures. If you remember the book of Job, Job's friend who comes to speak with him, the, his friend Eliphaz, the uh, Temanite, he said to Job, quote, whoever perished being innocent. Or as Job, you're saying you're innocent, you're saying you're not guilty, you're saying you didn't sin against God. But Job, think about it a minute. When did the righteous ever be cut off? In other words, you must have done something. That was the thinking of that day. You must have done something. Even Jesus, or even Jesus' disciples, seeing a blind man said this, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This is a common way of thinking, but it's not, all, it's not just relegated to that age. Many years ago, which things you don't forget, you forgive, but it's hard to forget. Many years ago in this church, Susan had both of her grandfathers die in one week. It was really odd. I was working at McDonnell Douglas. It was weird to have to tell your boss you had just gotten funeral leave and now you needed funeral leave again. I had to show him the copy of the obituary. But both of these were God-fearing men. Both died within a week of each other. And somebody in this church who's not, no longer hasn't been here for a long time, but somebody in this church came up to Susan and said, you must have done something horribly wrong for God to have punished you that way. I don't want to forget that because I don't want to do that to anybody. But, you know, this is kind of a way of thinking that, you know, and it's the, it's the damnable thing of, of Hinduism. And you say, well, what's that got to do with this? When I was, when I was and it's kind of funny because where I was was where Ravi Zacharias was born. When I was working in India and I was over there on corporate business and they had us at a, um, I don't know what the right word for it was, a big mansion that they had refurbished and they took very good care of us. We were spoiled rotten. We would take our days and go out and visit all these plants that were in the different area and then at night we would come back. That was home base and we'd always have meals served to us by servants and, and they were servants and it was just amazing. But I won't forget going out and walking around the grounds. Everything was just manicured perfectly. And there were two women laying on the ground literally picking the grass to the right height, picking one blade of grass at a time. And they did this day in, day out, as long as there was sunlight, they were out there picking the grass. I asked our host, I'd gotten pretty close to him, he knew I was a Christian, I knew he was a Hindu, but we were able to talk, we respected each other's beliefs. And uh, so, that, that, if you, and you might say, well, that was wrong. You shouldn't have respected If you don't respect their beliefs, they're never going to talk to you. You won't be able to share anything with them. So this man and I were able to talk about the Lord. But I asked him, I said, what's going on out there? He said, see, they, they'll want to tell you that the caste system isn't in place anymore, but it is. And these women were picking this grass because, and it's right back to our story, because they believed because, you know, they believe in reincarnation. So they believe that in a previous life, they had done, must have done something wrong to be this poor in this life. And so this is, this, they, weren't, they weren't brought into a higher caste in their next life. They were with the lowest of the lowest. And they are picking this grass because of something they did in a previous life. Now here's the hellacious thing about this. And I mean that sincerely. This is a devil. Because if you had gone up to those women, and they weren't very old. And you had said to these young ladies, I will give you, I will pay your way through four years of college. They would have told you, I won't take it. Why? 
because they believed that they were picking grass because of something they'd done in a previous life, and this was their karma. They know there's another life coming in their way of thought, and so to make sure they don't mess this up again, they're going to do their duty as God has shown them their duty, and they believe they are supposed to pick this grass as their job until they get to their next life, and if they're obedient in this life, then they'll get something better in the next life. And so the cycle never ends. It never ends for them. So this is a pretty common way of thinking, and it was a very common way. He showed you what Jesus' own disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that this, this child is born blind? It may well be that this paralytic man believed that he must have done something absolutely terrible to be in the condition that he's in. That maybe he had, uh, who was he to argue with divine justice? You know, I see this attitude. The prisons are filled with men and women. Haven't been to the prison for quite a while. I don't see anything happening, changing until the COVID thing changes. But, but it sure has taught me a lot. And the, the prisons are full, right here across the way, filled with men, and I'm sure women in their prison, who don't believe that they have done anything right enough for God to forgive them or for salvation. In prison or out, there are many people that think, that they have gone beyond the scope of God's mercy and his forgiveness. They think they've crossed a line with God that is of no return. They can't love themselves. Their victims won't forgive them. Their families won't forgive them. So how could God forgive them? Even the prodigal son thought he would not get forgiveness, but the best he could get was to be a servant. So this is a, a really a terrible way to think, but sometimes it's an easy way to think. We do it ourselves. Sometimes we fall off the wagon. Sometimes we miss the grace of God. I shouldn't say miss the grace of God. It's when we need the grace of God. And we do something stupid, and we think God can't forgive me for that. And sometimes it, it hurts our relationship with God, and or else we feel like we have to prove something when the truth is we don't have to prove anything because Jesus has proved it for us. And, uh, you know, we don't realize sometimes how much, how much people really need to hear the true gospel, that there's nothing they can do to separate them from the love of God because the love of God isn't in their performance. It is in what God has done for them in Christ. The only way that God could stop loving you is to stop loving Jesus. And that will never happen. So that may have been the thinking with this man. Whatever the reason, the paralytic did not go to Jesus the first time. They were going to get, it, get, get him this time. They, whether family or friends, were people who didn't understand everything Jesus was saying and doing, but they believed full well that if he could just get people to Jesus, something was going to happen. I love the story. You know, most of the houses in Israel at that time had an outside stairwell. I don't know what your thinking is on this, trying to lift this man up on it. They probably took him up the steps. The flattened roofs that they had were easily repaired, but they broke through the roof just so they could get this man in front of Jesus. They had no idea exactly what Jesus was going to do. They just knew that if you got people to Jesus, something happened. And so they tore through that building. They took him up on that upper level. They tore through that building. But the reason that we, or I particularly, love this story, this is the clearest validation, I think, of in Scripture that we have of intercessory faith. We may not be able to bring phys people physically to Jesus. We all have people in our families, loved ones, people we work with, people we know those within our immediate families and our extended families, that if we had the power to just grab them, take them, and bring them, and literally Jesus was standing here, we would, all we would have to know is if we could just get them to Jesus. Because our faith is in Jesus, that he will do something. And so these, these people, they didn't know exactly what Jesus was going to do, but they just knew that he was the man and he could do something. Maybe these were the family. You know, I, I think, and I'm not trying to be ignorant here, but maybe these were the people that had to wipe his butt and empty out his... His, you know, his 
can where he went to the bathroom. He couldn't, you know, in the, when I was in India, they still went out into the fields to go to the bathroom. They didn't have plumbing. It's a very poor country. It was very poor in Capernaum. This man can't walk. This man can't go outside the city gate to defecate and do what he had to do in private. That's what they did in those days. Everything he had to do had to happen in the home. Somebody had to take care of him, just like, this, just like John. He was very honest. Somebody has to do everything for her, even to lovingly wiping their behind. And maybe it was the family who just had it up to him. Maybe they loved him. But maybe they just said, you know, Jesus is our one and only hope here. We've been doing this for years. This is not a good way to live for him or for us. But either way, they, they had made the determination they were going to get to him. And like I said, it is a clear revelation that we can intercede for others who, have, who absolutely show no faith. That's the important thing. We see nothing in this story about this man showing any faith. If I'm perceiving it right, he hasn't even asked to go. He's being brought there. Maybe in his mind he thinks this is all a waste of time. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what I did, but I must have done something so heinous that God himself would put me under this kind of judgment. I'm not going to bother the master. Maybe that was what he said the first time. Don't bother. Don't take me there. There's no sense in taking me to Jesus. I've got what I deserve. And until I'm somehow forgiven of my sin, I can't do it. But we have this picture of intercessory faith. The, the key being that they don't have to believe before we can believe for them. It's, it's nice to know if we're waiting on loved ones who are not in the Lord and wondering if we're going to have to show some faith before we can pray for them or do something. These, these men had faith for a man who expressed no faith at all. In fact, the Bible is filled with stories. The Roman centurion who came to Christ. Because there, 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 there's one stage of faith better than even what we're seeing here. Jesus admired their faith. They'd put a hole in the roof. might have been his house. But he was impressed by the faith that they would bring this man and let nothing stop them from getting this man to Jesus Christ. And he appreciated that. But remember the Roman centurion who comes to Christ and he says, my servant is sick. We read nothing that the servant has any faith. We read nothing that the servant asked him to go. All we know is, is this man loved his servant and his servant was sick and he heard that Jesus was a man who could get things done. Because remember, he came to Jesus. Jesus said, because he had the faith to believe that his servant was already healed. He said, well, I remember he said, you can come to my house. I'll come to your house. And the man says, no, you don't have to come to my house. All you have to do is say the word. Because I see that you are a man under authority as I am under authority. And I know if you will just speak the word. Wouldn't it have been great if that family had come to Jesus and said, look, he doesn't want to come. He thinks he's under God's judgment. We've been taking care of him for years. He's a good guy, but it's a pathetic case. And we know you can do something about it. We know if you just speak the word, they would go home and find him healed. Either way, it would have been a great statement of faith, and it was a great statement of faith. Jesus himself said he admired their faith as they brought him to him. It says here, then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken through, they let him down, they let him down, they let down the bed on which he was, the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. When he saw their faith, has nothing to do with the paralytic. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. What do you think at that moment, though, that family or those friends thought? You just moved heaven and earth to get this man in front of Jesus so he could be healed. And so you did it. You got him down. You lowered him down. And I mean, there had to be such an expression of relief that Jesus, there was no animosity, nobody disclaiming this, nobody saying this was a bad move, or how dare you break through a roof. But here's Jesus looking up, admiring their faith that they would do everything they could to get this man here, because this man needs healing. And they're waiting to hear the word, and Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. They had to be going, wait a minute! If we wanted his sins forgiven, we could have taken him to Jerusalem. We would have found out from the priest maybe what we had to kill, what we had to sacrifice. The man needs healing. And you're saying, son, 
your sins are forgiven you. They might not have... This happens every time we bring God the answer to the prayer. I'm a keen believer in this kingdom principle that you pray the end result and let God be God. I'll share this for the umpteenth time because it's important. Worked with a man at McDonnell Douglas, young Christian. He needed $300. He understood the agreement of prayer that when two people agree, that God says, I'll grant you what you ask for when you agree in faith. And so he asked me one day, he came up to me, he said, Skip, he said, will you agree with me that God's going to sell my chainsaw so I can get $300 that I need? I said, no. He said, why? I said, why limit God to the sale of your chainsaw? Why not just believe God for the $300? He may have a way to bring it to you that you haven't even thought of. Why will you limit God by giving him the answer to the prayer? You see, they were limiting God because they thought he needed healing. If I'm right in my summation of this story, this man needed forgiveness far before he needed healing. And if he didn't get the forgiveness, the healing would probably never come. How often? Be careful with that because it's very easy with the creative minds that God has given us that we try to figure out the problem and we give God the answer to the problem and ask him to bless our plan. Bless him, Lord. Heal him. But God knows something about that man that they don't know. This man is paralyzed in his spirit because he believes he's under the condemnation of God because of his sins. And he needed his sins forgiven much more than he needed his legs to move. In fact, I wrote it that way. I wanted you to just see it. It may well be, well be that without the healing of this man's paralyzed spirit, there never have could have been the healing of his paralyzed body. He had to know God's love before he could know God's power. They may have been shocked by Jesus' words, while this man may have found comfort and a healing like no one ever knew. You know, that's no different than the leper from last week's story. How, again, you got to understand, there is four fishermen watching this that are constantly repenting because they keep wanting to do things the old way and they see Jesus doing everything. You know, we'll see in a moment that they agree with the scribes. Who is this man and who does he think he is that he can forgive sins? And they're watching this, and this, this has really got to have be, be, be playing with their minds. Jesus' reputation has reached Jerusalem. Because, and again, the point I was trying to make about the leper was, all he had to do was speak a word. But that leper needed something more than healing. He needed to be touched we don't know how long he was a leper but from the moment that the priest declared him a leper he never felt human touch again it's against the law couldn't touch his wife couldn't touch his children couldn't touch his grandchildren couldn't touch anybody and nobody could touch him and everybody would have thought even the leper thought that his greatest need was for healing but his greatest need, the Lord knew, was to be touched. Same thing here. Greatest thing this man needed was to have his sins forgiven. Jesus' reputation had reached Jerusalem because you remember that after Jesus healed the leper, he said, don't say anything to anybody. Go your way. Go to the priest and show yourself and then give the, give the, uh, um, the sacrifice that Moses required which for them was a four-day walk from Galilee to Jerusalem. Show yourself to the priest. Shave your body of all hair. Go into quarantine for a week. And let, the, let him judge at the end of that week that no, there is no change in your, your body. That you were definitely free from the leprosy. And then and then only would you be declared free from leprosy. But you know that a man that has been cleaned of leprosy, in fact, that's what Jesus told him. He said, be clean. He was telling everybody. In fact, we read about that. This is why the crowds are so bad. Well, he, uh, he, he, was, he didn't shut up just because he got to Jerusalem. He's got a story to tell. I mean, just think about it. He had to tell the story to the priest. 
Uh oh. You're what? Healed. My leprosy's gone. I come down here to show it to you like I'm supposed to. I want to do what the law of Moses commands. Well, how'd this happen? That's all it took. How'd this happen? Well, there's a guy up in Galilee. He touched me. And he told me I do well. You know, it, it, there's some modern things today that help us maybe understand what's going on. Do you realize that in his own way, Jesus had to drain the swamp? The hierarchy that was in place in Jerusalem was terrible. The, priest, the, the high office of the priest was being sold. It was, it, was, it was just like gangsters running wild. Remember Jesus going in there with the, with the whips and getting, running all the money changers out. He had to drain the swamp. He was making the establishment uneasy. They thought it best to send some scouting parties out to attend one of these Make Israel Great Again meetings that Jesus was holding. So we read this. After he said to this man, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Here we go. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Because actually Jesus agreed with them. Only God can forgive sins. They just weren't going to accept that he was God. So he would have to prove that he was God. Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, I'm, I'm misspelling. Arise, take up your bed and walk. In other words, what he was saying is, what's easier of those two? For me. Claiming that I am a Messiah. That the anointing of God is on me. Which is easier for me to say, easily for him to say, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because you can't prove it. Very easy to do something that you can't prove. I've seen it happen. Seen people abuse things. Lord just gave me a word for you. Woman, what's your first name? Susan, Lord just gave me a word from you. He had a tumor in your stomach and he has healed it right now. You don't have any way of knowing if I told the truth or not. If it's gone, all you, I can say that, that that happened. You don't know. If I can tell you your sin's forgiven, how are you going to prove it? So it's real easy to say your sins are forgiven. But if you make a blind, if you make a, a lame man walk, then you've proven something. So that was his point here. That was his point here. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know, that you may know that the Son of Man, that Messianic title from Daniel, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go your way to your house. The fact that the man got up and walked was the absolute proof that his sins were forgiven. They tie hand in hand. Go your way to your house. Without faith, we know that it is impossible to please God. So now his friends or family have gotten him through the roof, have gotten him down to the floor in front of Jesus. And now it's his turn. He said to the cleric, I say to you, not to your friends, not to anybody else, this is between me and you, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go your way to your house. I don't believe that could have happened if Jesus hadn't first forgiven that man his sins. Because you had to do something in that man's spirit that he understood, that he could get up. Because I believe if you left that one off, I believe this was the first account we might have read where Jesus said to somebody, I say to you, rise and walk, and they still laid there. Because he wouldn't have had the faith. He wouldn't have had the knowledge that God was no longer mad at him. No longer upset with him. And, and, and did you think about this? These four disciples are watching this. And they're always being brought to this point of repentance where they have to rethink the kingdom. Remember Jesus' 
preaching the gospel isn't, I come to die for your sins. He says, the gospel he preaches, the kingdom of God is at hand. Accept it, face it, accept it, grab it, move with it. And so this was really, really hard for them. Because the thing you would have asked was, how did he forgive this man's sins? Because where, where is the priest? Where is the sacrifice? Where is the temple? Where is that offering? How is this man going to have the forgiveness of his sins? Because the one who is telling him his sins are forgiven, the disciples have to learn, is the temple, is the offering, is the priest, is the Son of God. He is, he is all that that they believed in for 1,500 years is now coming to life in front of them. He is the Son of Man, the Messiah. And he can forgive sins in his own power, in his own way, because he is the one that would remove the sins of the world. It is a great story. It is a great story. Let's pray. Father, there's a number of things that I hope we take home with us today from this. Number one, that we get reassurance. I mean, sometimes I think it's very frustrating when we pray for others. Because sometimes it's years of praying. Years of praying. And Lord, yet we know that you are faithful. And Lord, you give us these stories from Scripture to build up our faith and to understand that we have the uh, ability, we have the responsibility to pray for others, Lord God, even if they show no faith in themselves. Lord, isn't that what salvation is all about? Somebody prayed for us. Everyone in this room, nobody was born into salvation except through you and through somebody's prayers. So Lord, keep us encouraged that we can pray for others who do not know, Lord God, and that you'll honor our faith on their behalf. Isn't that love? When we lay down what we need in our things and Lord trusting you for those things and instead spend our time in prayer on those people that need our faith to be expressed for them. Lord, I just pray that you'll just keep encouraging with that. And Lord, that we also would understand, in case there's anybody in this room that doesn't understand it, that there is no sin that you can't forgive. No sin at all. You might say, well, what about the sin against the Holy Spirit? That's not a sin you commit, it's what you become. And if you can even ask yourself that question, you have not committed it. Lord, there is no sin that can separate us from you, Father. The great Father that you are, no sin can separate us from you. Because we are in your Son, Christ Jesus. I thank you that your word doesn't say that your love is in us. Your love is in your Son. And nobody can take us from that love. So, Father, I hope that, that we will know that for ourselves. We will know that for others. We will use that as a basis of our praying and faith, Lord God, for those that you bring into our lives. And Father, we know that Jesus said tribulation will come in this life. Lord, it's not to say that you can't use a circumstance to get our attention. I believe that happens. But Lord, to say that if something bad happens in our life, it's definitely because we did something. Lord, we know the fallacy of that. Father, we just saw recently with the death of Ravi Zacharias, if ever there was a voice that most of us would say was needed in the world right now, it would have been him. And yet, Lord, he suffered and died. But that had nothing to do with him being a godly man. So we learn these things. I look at Grandma, and I think about her a lot, Grandma Weens, going through all the things she does with her sight and the problems that it brings. What a godly woman she is. Lord, life comes. But you know, you said, Lord, that we shouldn't fear because you've overcome the world. So like I saw with those Christian people on that conference about chronic pain, that ultimately they found out that with you they could do anything. With you they could suffer all things. With you they could overcome all things. Lord, you are great and good and perfect God. And we thank you. And we thank you, Lord, that no matter what prayer we bring to you, I thank you that you are the God who can see past, past what we think is best, Lord, past what we're trying to do to the best of our ability. And Lord, you know the real need. And you always meet that need in Christ. So thank you, Father. Thank you for this story. May it be more than just a story, but a principles of kingdom that stay with us. And like the apostles, may we repent of wrong thinking and understand that the kingdom of God is here and now. And that we would grasp it and live it and move in it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great Father's Day, beloved.